morning, everybody. If you would stand and turn to number 290. We'll sing all four verses. <laughs>
Good morning. We're glad that you're here and hope you have come to worship. We're going to continue in the book of Matthew here in just a few minutes and uh, look at, well, as I heard one preacher say, this is not going to be one of those Robert Shuler feel-good messages. Um, it's a very somber passage and a scary passage um, to think about. So we'll look at that, just the first four verses of chapter 16 in just a few minutes. This is our last Sunday for the uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering. I know it seems like, or it does to me, it seems like it's been a year since Christmas. But it has been a month, and uh, so anyway, we'll uh, conclude that. Uh, today, and I don't think I know anything else. Oh, did you bring it in? No. There was. I've got a, another box in the car. I guess for February, if you can believe that, uh, of magazines. But look in the back, and I'll get them and bring them in before we get gone today. Because uh, this is, if you're gonna do something else in January, you need to get after it this afternoon. Because it's going to be February tomorrow. All right. Good to see you. And I love you. Now I'll turn to number 296. I'm going to sing all three verses. take God's word and turn to the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We're at a turning point in the Gospel of Matthew. We've seen Jesus presented as king through his heritage, through his birth, through the proclamation of the wise men. 
through his baptism, through his temptation, through his ministry, his message, the miracles that he did. And all through that, the religious people have rejected him. And chapter 16 makes a turning point. We have the parables in Matthew chapter 13. And Jesus has given us eight examples of those of the parables, specifically of the sower. And six of those reject him, either because of the cares of the world or the uh, not having any root or just out and out rejecting him. And only two receive him. And that's about the percentage he gives us in the parable of the sower. There's uh, three that don't, three soils that don't produce and only one that does. And so we have really a, a turning point here and Jesus is beginning to go toward Jerusalem and probably more famous when you think of Matthew chapter 16 is Peter's confession. After Jesus gives the parables, he tells the, he shows the disciples the fulfillment of those parables and then he asks them, who am I? And then he is on the way to Jerusalem to fulfill the reason that he came. I was going to say, if you, if you meant that song that we just sang, you can probably go on home. You don't hear a preacher say that. If Jesus is Lord of all, then you may not need to hear what I'm going to say. But he is Lord. The question is, is he your Lord? So Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. The Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for this time. We're grateful for an opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I pray that you would teach us through your Holy Spirit the inspired word of God that we have before us today. We pray that you would be glorified in this time of worship in Jesus' name, amen. We have here a, a group that we would, well, if I can say it like this, in this divided society that we live in, in the divided government that we have, the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming together to get rid of Jesus would be like the Democrats and the Republicans coming together to get rid of somebody does that that don't sound like anywhere you know about does it the Pharisees I start to say the Republicans the, the Pharisees the Pharisees were the religious conservatives they believed the Bible they even and this was part of their problem, even more so than the words of Scripture were the words that they had interpreted what the Scripture meant. And Jesus tells them on occasions, you care more about the traditions of men, the writings of men, rather than the writings, the words of God. The Sadducees were the religious liberals they didn't believe the Bible. They typically believed the first five books of the Bible, but not much of the rest of it. And they didn't believe in miracles at all. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in the resurrection or angels, Paul tells us in the book of Acts. And yet these two groups came together, combined their efforts to get rid of Jesus Christ. 
because he was an offense to them. The Pharisees were conservative, supposedly, and believed. But they, well, were like the church in Ephesus. They believed all the right things, and they were even against all the right things, but they didn't love God. And so this group comes together, uh, a very, well, as I heard one person say, I'm not the left wing or the right wing because they're both flapping on the same old bird. And truly, these two groups, the right and the left, were flapping on the same bird, the bird of unbelief. People who were spiritually blind and to a certain extent, we're all spiritually blind. And before we're saved, we're all spiritually blind. In the next verse, I tried to, I was going to try to go all the way to verse 12, but I can see this getting away from me, so I'm going to stop at verse 4, so you'll be tickled with that. In verse 4, we'll see the disciples are somewhat spiritually blind. Jesus has to reprimand them again. Oh, ye of little faith. But they believe. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, as a group, didn't believe. They are those who are spiritually blind and who never see. Those who are spiritually blind and never see are deniers. They deny the truth of God. They deny the inspired word. They had heard Jesus teach we call it the Sermon on the Mount. We spend a great deal of time in Matthew 5 through 7. And when Jesus finished his teaching, the people said, or the, Matthew tells us, the people were astonished. They marveled. They wondered. They couldn't believe what this man was teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They couldn't believe his teaching, and not only could they not believe how marvelous it was, they did not believe it. They didn't receive it. John's Gospel tells us about the leaders of the temple. Typically, that was the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, I mean, the Sadducees made up the chief priest and the sort of the political side of the religion. They were the wealthy and the rich, the, we would say the corporate people. And they had the money, and they wanted to stay in power, and they wanted to get rid of Jesus in order to do it. So they sent a group to arrest him. They came back, and they hadn't arrested him. They came back, and the officers of the temple said, Why didn't you bring him? We sent you to arrest him. Why didn't you bring him back? And they said, Never a man spake like this man. And yet they denied it. They denied the inspired truth of God. Millions of people deny the Bible today. There's this comedian, I, can't, I think it's Jeff Allen is his name, and he is a Christian and I was listening to it, and he sort of gives his testimony during this during his comedy, and uh, and you can listen to it. He's, he's he doesn't use profanity and innuendo and all that. But he was losing his marriage, losing his job, and he a friend of his that was very successful that he was trying to kind of butter up to help him get a job. And they went to play golf, and he was so excited to get to play golf with this guy. And so he got to talking to him, and he said, I know the answer to all your problems, and it's Jesus. He's like, what? Here's this successful man, and he's talking about Jesus in the Bible? And he said, oh, I don't believe in any of the comedians. I don't believe in any of that. He said, that's just crazy. And the guy said, he said, I'm an atheist or an agnostic or... I just don't believe any of that. 
And the guy said, so you've read the whole Bible and decided it wasn't true. And he said, no, I hadn't read any of it. And he said, well, you're not an agnostic. You're just ignorant. <laughs> you hadn't tried it. People say, I don't believe the Bible. And they hadn't even read it. John said, I wrote my gospel so you could read it and see that Jesus is the Christ. And by knowing he's the Christ, you could have life through his name. And people don't even try. They deny, as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they denied the inspired truth of God. They also denied the incarnate truth of God. Jesus is God. Jesus, in that famous passage, I share with you a lot, in John 14, 1 through 6, if you've been to a funeral, you've probably heard it before. Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When I prepare a place, I'll come back and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And he said, and you know where I'm going and you know the way. And Thomas says, we don't know. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And I always stop there. But let's go a little farther. Jesus said, if you, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. And that would be sufficient. That would be good enough. If you just show us the Father, we'll believe. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long that you don't know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. As most of you know, I love the book of Hebrews. And how could you not love a book that starts out this way? God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto our fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. How could you not want to keep reading that? Jesus is God's last word. He spoke in other ways and different times and different ways, but now he's spoken to us by Christ. And the rest of the book of Hebrews tells us that Christ is better than everything else, than angels, than the prophets, than Aaron, than Moses, everything. Jesus is the fulfillment of it all. People who are spiritually blind and will not see are deniers. They just deny it. They may not have even tried, but they deny it. Second, they're demanders. Give me some proof. I believe very firmly in the six days of creation and a, a young earth, as some people call it. And people will kind of look at you kind of funny. I was talking to a very good friend of mine, and he had been to the ARC exhibit in Kentucky. And he said, I really like the exhibit and stuff, but the way he told it, you know, the earth is only six to 10,000 years old, and it's only been around so long. And I was like, yeah, isn't that great? He was like, oh, do you really believe that? Why would I not? We have people, when you believe that, they'll say, well, prove it to me. The Pharisees said they had accused Jesus of being from Satan. The miracles that he had done were from Satan. And they said, give us a sign from heaven, not this stuff you've been doing. Show us something that we'll know you from you're from heaven. People who don't believe and in my opinion who are not wanting to believe 
always demand a sign. They wanted Jesus to show them a trick. Do something. And I've told you this before. If we had a healing service this morning, if we, and especially with us being on Facebook, if we could roll somebody down this aisle in a wheelchair and I could go down and pop them in the top of the head and they stood up and danced around, we might have to wear a mask next Sunday. There'd be so many folks here. Look what he did. That's proof. Well, it's not proof. Jesus says, you have my word. You have the signs I've already done. You can look at the sky at night and say it's red and it's going to be pretty tomorrow. Or, as we used to say, red in the morning is a sailor's morning. You can look and tell what the weather's going to do, but you can't see a true sign from heaven. Signs are dangerous. The same sign that could help somebody could condemn others. Do you know the Egyptians, in a real way, they experienced the miracles, the plagues of Egypt, even more so than the Israelites did, and yet the miracles that brought freedom to Israel hardened Pharaoh's heart. When you see the miracle of a changed life. I know I've told you this story before, but maybe you've forgotten it. I hope not. But anyway, I'm going to share it again. My, one of my favorite Sunday school teachers was a man named Pal Watkins. That's the way he spelled it, P-A-L. Well, his, this is his words. He wasn't an alcoholic. He was a drunk. He would work enough to get paid, and then he would go off on the bench and leave his family at home alone, would spend all the money he had made, and then sober up enough to work and get some more. And that was his life. His family, his wife's family had to take care of her and their children because he was always gone. One Sunday morning, we were having a revival at Antioch, and for he said, I don't know why, but I drove from Lester's Chapel over here on 47 all the way to Columbiana, to Antioch. Brother Charles Stroud, former associational missionary, was preaching a revival, and he was saved that morning. And his sister-in-law, who had taken care of her sister while he was out drinking, all I knew was Pal, the Sunday school teacher. She knew pal, the alcoholic. And she said, if you had only known him before, you would know what a miracle God is to change a life. They demanded a sign. Signs are also deceiving. The Bible says that even the devil can do signs and miracles. And in the tribulation period, I believe it's talking about 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul says this antichrist, this Adrian Rogers called him Satan Superman, will come. He will come after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Even the magicians in Egypt could copy some of the signs that God did through Moses. Jesus said there won't be any sign given to this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As we talked about earlier, I believe it's in Matthew 12, Jesus had said as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, so will the Son of Man be in the earth three days. 
Dr. McGee, in his commentary, believes that Jonah actually died to fulfill the prophecy that Jesus made here. That God resurrected him. I don't know if he did or not. I believe he could if he wanted to. But they, Jesus said, no sign will be given this generation but the sign of the prophet Jonah, and they didn't believe that. In Matthew chapter 28, the bewildered guards came back from the tomb and they came into Jerusalem and they told what had happened and the Pharisees said, or the Sanhedrin said, don't tell that story, whatever you do. Tell them that the disciples came and stole the body away and we'll give you this much money to lie about it and if the governor hears about it, we'll square it with him and tell him it's okay. They got the in person the message of Jonah and they didn't believe Jesus tells the story I don't believe it's a parable I believe it's a story in Luke chapter 16 about the rich man and Lazarus Lazarus was a poor man that sat by the rich man's gate and he begged for food and he was a believer in God Bible says, and this is one of the most compelling verses maybe in the Bible, Lazarus died and the rich man died also. Paints a very vivid picture of what hell will be like, I believe. The separation from God, the separation really from everybody. But in Jesus' story, he could see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And he said, somebody's got to go tell my brothers. I've got five brothers. Let Lazarus come back from the dead and explain to my brothers about this place so they won't come here. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures. They have the book. And he says, if they won't believe that, they won't even believe if somebody comes back from the dead. And guess what? Somebody did, and they didn't. They didn't believe. They demanded a sign, and they wouldn't have believed it even had Jesus done one. He had just got through healing and teaching people who are spiritually blind are deniers they're demanders and they are depraved verse 4 is really a scary verse I didn't when I read through it the first time I didn't see that and then John MacArthur's commentary points this out a wicked and adulterous generation. I got that part. I mean, how can you ask Jesus for that when he's already done that? Prove it to me. In other words, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign. And in the end of the verse, and he left them and departed. <coughs> What a scary verse. As in Judges, I think it's chapter 16 maybe, 13 through 16 tells the story about Samuel, uh, Samson. Samson was one of those people we want to shake and say, wake up. He had been a judge in Israel for 20 years and he was let his lusts and his appetites get the best of him. He married a woman he wasn't supposed to marry and uh, wound up killing people because of it. He then had an affair, we might say, with another woman who was not the sweet Delilah of the old Victor Mature movie, if you remember that. Oh, she, was, she wanted the best for Samson. She was right out of hell is where she was. And she tricked Samuel, who was Samson, 
who was easy to be tricked. Samson, tell me how how you get your strength. Well, if you'll take some vines, some green vines that's never been used before, and tie me up to that, I wouldn't be able to get out of it. Well, when I went to sleep and woke up with vines around me, it had been time to go then, the first time. But he did that. Then he told her, if you tie me up with a rope, that's never been used. Same thing happened. Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming. He got up, broke the vines. He got up, broke the ropes. Then he gets a little closer. If you'll braid my hair, my hair's never been braided. If you braid my hair, then I wouldn't be able to. Got him to sleep. Samson, the Philistines are coming. He got up, wore them out again. Finally, he made the last compromise. He broke the rest of his Nazarite vows except his hair. She cut his hair and she said, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming. He said, no problem. I'll just get up and do what I've always done. And he didn't know that the Spirit of God had left him. What a scary verse. To just keep on doing the same thing. The Pharisees kept doing the same thing and Bible says, and Jesus left them and departed. They had rejected him so long they didn't really notice anymore. They were, as Paul says, a natural man. He says the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know it because they're spiritually discerned. You ever tried to witness to somebody and share the gospel with them and they say, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. And it is. To somebody who is rejecting Christ, the gospel makes no sense. How can God become a man and he's on earth and he prays to himself and how can he come and die and still be God? That's just foolishness. That's crazy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 the preaching of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness. But to us who are being saved it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's always amazing to me to see somebody who you witnessed to and they thought it was so stupid and then they get saved and I had this one lady that come, came to me and she said, Hey, did you know this was in the Bible? <laughs> the excitement. The light came on. She had said yes. And now, instead of foolishness, it was the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul warns the Ephesians. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Men, men don't receive Christ not because they have intellectual problems, as some state. Well, I can't believe that about the Bible. I can't believe that about God. That just, that doesn't make sense. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And you don't have to do anything to be condemned. He that believes is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he did not receive 
the only begotten Son of God. And Jesus told Nicodemus, and this is the judgment, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because they have intellectual difficulties. <laughs> is that what it says? They love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Because of sin and sometimes because of Satan. In the story of the parable, the seed was sown, but they were hard-hearted, packed down, and Jesus said Satan comes and snatches it away. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, if our gospel is hid, it's hid to those who the God of this world has blinded their eyes lest they should believe. What a scary thing for us to reject Christ and reject Christ and reject Christ until finally we won't see. Until Jesus departs. If you would like something as relevant or as up to date as I guess I should say your news blog, not the newspaper. We don't know if anybody reads the newspaper anymore. But if you want something as current as your news, read Romans chapter 1. Paul says there's enough evidence just in creation alone that people can know there's a God. I mean, if you have just a little bit of sense, you can know that everything that we see around us didn't just happen. And from what we know, from what science has revealed about our bodies, you can know that, as Dr. Criswell used to say, you can know we weren't a tadpole once beginning to begin. And then I was a frog with my tail tucked in. You, you can know better than that just by the complexity of our bodies. But Paul says, God has shown us who he is. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So we can know there's a God. There's not enough in creation for us to be saved, but there's enough in creation for us to know there's a God. And if we seek that God, he will reveal himself to us. But, Paul says... When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Does that sound like anywhere you know? They, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible birth man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Does that sound like anywhere you know? Look how smart we are. Look what we've discovered. Look what we know about the climate and the earth is changing and all that. And we don't even know which bathroom to go to. Can you believe somebody is that stupid? That we think we're so smart and we can't even figure out that. We're foolish. We're darkened. We're depraved. When we take the things of God and throw them out the window and brag about how smart we are. And Paul goes on to say, Wherefore God also gave them up. To uncleanness through the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever God gave them up okay go ahead do what you want to do and we're doing uncleanness and lust for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. 
And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was suitable. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not fitting. How awful that is that Jesus would depart, that God would give us up. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, as a group, never got over their spiritual blindness. They denied the inspired and the incarnate word of God. They demanded a sign, which they wouldn't have believed anyway. And they were left to their depravity. Does that sound like anywhere you know? In America, I think we are spiritually blind as a nation. We have denied the inspired and the incarnate word of God. We have demanded things of God instead of obeying him. And I believe God has left us as a nation, given us over to uncleanness and lust, has given us up to vile affections, and has given us over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. There's good news. Jesus died so that we don't have to be spiritually blind. We can receive him today. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, others who were part of this group receive their sight, maybe more miraculously than the beggar by the side of the road who received his physical sight. Jesus came to give sight to the blind, but we must receive him. We can't keep going like we are. We can't keep denying his word. We can't keep demanding Lord, do this. Lord, do this. Lord, do this. We have to receive him. We have to say, in effect, what we say. Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of my thoughts and my service each day. Jesus is Lord of all. If that's not your testimony this morning. Make him make him your Lord today. You can't make him Lord. He's already Lord. Make him your Lord. Receive him as your Lord today. Paul says in Romans 10 if you'll confess that Jesus is Lord believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you'll be saved. And whoever does that will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We're thankful for your word. We pray, Lord, that if our hearts are stirred this morning, that we would answer your call before it is too late, before our spiritual blindness leads to giving up for God to leave us. Lord, speak to those this morning who need you as Savior. Lord, for those of us who know you as Lord and Savior, help us to make you Lord each day. Lord of our thoughts. Lord of everything that we do. For you are truly Lord of all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have our hymn of invitation. Would you come as we stand and sing? Two eighty five.